In 1656, the elders of the Jewish synagogue in Amsterdam pronounced the following judgment. With the judgment of the angels and the saints, we excommunicate, cut off, curse, and anathematize Baruch de Espinosa. With the anathema wherewith Joshua cursed Jericho, with the curse which Elisha laid upon the children, and with all the curses which are written in the law. Cursed be he by day, and cursed be he by night. Cursed be he in sleeping, and cursed be he in waking. Cursed in going out, and cursed in coming in. The Lord shall not pardon him. The wrath and fury of the Lord shall henceforth be kindled against this man, and he shall lay upon him all the curses which are written in the book of the law. The Lord shall destroy his name under the sun and cut him off for his undoing from all the tribes of Israel. And we warn you that none may speak with him by word of mouth nor by writing, nor show any favor to him, nor be under one roof with him, nor come within four cubits of him, nor read any papers composed or written by him. With this terrifying pronouncement, the leaders of the Amsterdam synagogue excommunicated the brightest young man in their community. His ideas were too heretical, too new and dangerous for them, so they severed their relationship with him forever. At the age of 24, Spinoza was irrevocably cut off from his family and from the community where he'd grown up, studied, worked, and worshipped. What were these ideas of his which provoked the temple elders to such drastic measures? Well, they were ideas about God and nature, about the Bible and politics, about how human beings ought to live, and about the greatest joy we can aspire to. They're timeless ideas. They've influenced serious thinkers for centuries. Though they cost Spinoza his place in the community, they've earned for him a place in the permanent roster of truly profound and original philosophers. Different ages have understood Spinoza's ideas in very different ways. For example, in the 18th century, he was referred to as an infamous atheist. In the 19th century, the German author Novalis said of him, Spinoza was a God-intoxicated man. Because of his carefully logical, rational way of thinking, scientists have often found Spinoza to be appealing. Einstein, for example, called himself a disciple of Spinoza. On the other hand, romantic poets have also found in him a kindred spirit. Coleridge and Goethe, Matthew Arnold and Heinrich Heine, all have praised the sensitivity and beauty of his thought. Goethe wrote, for example, I hurried back again and again to those works of his to which I was so indebted. The same air of peace blew over me. I gave myself over to the reading of Spinoza, and while I thereby looked upon myself, I believed that I had never looked upon the world with such clarity. What kind of philosophy could appeal so deeply both to analytically-minded scientists and to romantic visionaries and poets? What kind of theology could provoke charges both of atheism and of God intoxication? What kind of a man was Spinoza that he could endure the trauma of excommunication and public disgrace and yet write works which breathe an air of the deepest calm and serenity? Baruch Spinoza was born in 1632 in the bustling city of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Perhaps no other city of that time was quite as vital, quite as prosperous, or quite as progressive. 17th century Amsterdam was home to Rembrandt, a neighbor of Spinoza's. It was also home to Leeuwenhoek, the inventor of the microscope, and to Christian Huygens, the famous mathematician and physicist. Commerce was king. The harbor was filled with trading ships returning from distant lands laden with exotic wares. Amsterdam was also a center for free trade in ideas, at least by the standards of the time. In fact, the city's tolerance of religious diversity led Spinoza's parents to settle there when they were forced to leave their native Portugal. The Spinozas were Jewish, and the Catholic Inquisition offered the Jews in Spain and Portugal only three alternatives, conversion to Christianity, death, or exile. The families of Mikael and Hannah de Bora de Spinoza chose exile. 
sailed to Amsterdam and settled into the city's sizable Jewish enclave. Mikael and Hanne Deborah chose the name Baruch for their son, a name which means blessed in Hebrew. Baruch Spinoza was educated in the Jewish boys' school. He may have thought of becoming a rabbi. But as his studies progressed, he became less and less convinced by his teacher's orthodox interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures and commentaries. Baruch sharpened his mind to a fine edge through the study of these works, but he was not satisfied with them. As a teenager, Spinoza became curious about other ideas. He undertook to learn Latin so he could also study the works of Christian and secular thinkers. At the time, almost all such works were written in Latin. However, these interests on the part of a young man may have seemed a little suspect in the Jewish community. Latin, in addition to being the universal language of the learned, also was the clerical language of the hated Inquisition. The more Spinoza studied the works of other philosophers and theologians, the more his thinking differed from the views of his teachers and his fellows in the synagogue. Perhaps it was inevitable that his own unorthodox ideas would bring him into conflict with the authorities of the Jewish community. He was offered the chance to recant his heresies, but he refused to compromise. And so, just as his parents had been forced into exile from Portugal because they wouldn't abandon their religious beliefs, so Spinoza was exiled from his community for refusing to relinquish his philosophical convictions. After his excommunication at the age of 24, Spinoza changed his first name, Baruch, to its Latin equivalent, Benedictus. He lived a quiet life, talking sometimes with a group of Protestant Christians, unorthodox like himself. He exchanged letters with various important businessmen, philosophers, and scientists who showed an interest in his ideas. An early biographer, Coleris, provides the following description of his appearance as a young man. He was of a middle size. He had good features in his face. The skin somewhat black. The hair dark and curly, the eyebrows long and black, so that one might easily know by his looks that he was descended from Portuguese Jews. As for his clothes, he was very careless of them, and they were not better than those of the meanest citizen. One of the most eminent councillors of state went to see him and found him in a very untidy morning gown, whereupon the councillor reproached him for it and offered him another. Spinoza answered him that a man was never the better for having a fine gown. Spinoza's frugality showed not only in his clothes but in his entire manner of life. He lived in self-imposed poverty, making his very modest living as a lens grinder. On several occasions, People offered him considerable sums of money, but he never accepted. A friend, Simon de Vries, tried to give him 2,000 florins, about $1,000, to make his life easier. But Spinoza asked that he make the gift smaller, explaining that such a large sum would surely distract him from his work and his studies. In 1673, Spinoza was approached by a representative of the Elector Palatine, Karl Ludwig who invited him to assume the prestigious position of professor of philosophy at the University of Heidelberg. Again, Spinoza turned down the opportunity to achieve a comfortable income and great professional status. The invitation had indicated that he would be allowed full freedom of philosophizing, but on the condition that he not undermine the established Protestant Reformed religion. Spinoza replied in a characteristically polite letter. If I had ever entertained a wish to take on a professorship in any faculty, I could have desired no other than that which is offered me through you by His Serene Highness the Elector Palatine, particularly on account of that freedom of philosophizing which the most gracious prince is pleased to offer, to say nothing of my long-felt desire to live under the rule of a prince whose wisdom all admire. Since, however, it was never my intention to give public instruction, I cannot be induced to embrace this glorious opportunity. In a later passage of the letter, Spinoza voices his deeper concerns regarding the position offered him. I think that I do not know within what limits that freedom of philosophizing ought to be confined in order to avoid the appearance of wishing to disturb the publicly established religion. For schisms arise 
not so much from an ardent love of religion, but from men's various dispositions, or the love of contradiction, through which they are wont to distort and to condemn all things, even those which have been correctly stated. I have already experienced these things while living a private and solitary life, much more than are they to be feared after I shall have been raised to this honoured position. Thus you see, most honoured sir, that I am not holding back in the hope of some better fortune, but from love of peace. Spinoza's peace and quiet were too important to him to risk the distractions and the political pressures which would accompany a prestigious academic position. In the twenty years between his excommunication and his death at age 44, Spinoza moved five different times to various cities in the Netherlands. In each city he rented a room in the house of a local inhabitant. Coleris, his biographer, tells us the following about his daily life. His amusements were very simple. Talking on ordinary matters with the people of the house, smoking now and again a pipe of tobacco, watching the habits and quarrels of insects, making observations with a microscope. Such were his pastimes in the hours which he could spare from his philosophy. But the greater part of his day was taken up with severe metal work in his room. Sometimes he would become so absorbed that he would remain alone for two or three days together, his meals being brought up to him. Thus Spinoza worked away at his lenses and his philosophy in the cramped quarters which were his home. The glass dust which he must have breathed constantly weakened his lungs, and he died quietly of tuberculosis one Sunday afternoon in his last home city, The Hague. The simplicity and calm of Spinoza's life have spoken to later generations of his admirers as eloquently as have his written works. Matthew Arnold summed up the views of many as he wrote, Spinoza led a life the most spotless, perhaps, to be found among the lives of the philosophers. He lived simple, studious, even-tempered, kind, declining honours, declining riches, declining notoriety. Therefore, he has been in a certain sphere edifying and has inspired in many powerful minds an interest and an admiration such as no other philosopher has inspired since Plato. During Spinoza's short lifetime, he published only one book openly and one anonymously. At his death, his main work, an unpublished book called The Ethics, was left locked in a drawer. It was delivered to a friend who arranged for it to be published along with some of his letters and two other unfinished manuscripts. These few works are all that remain of Spinoza's thought. But in them we find a worldview and a philosophy of life unsurpassed in its scope, in its intellectual rigor, and according to some, in its relevance for our lives today. When we reflect that Spinoza's personal convictions cost him his place in the community, his relationship with his family, and the pleasures of wealth and status, we might wonder what motivated him to pursue his philosophical reflections with such tenacity. His works contain very little self-disclosure, but in the opening paragraphs of one of his unfinished manuscripts, he does relate his reasons for pursuing philosophical truth. He says that, like every human being, he was seeking happiness, true, permanent happiness, and that he'd been unable to find that in those things that attract most people's attentions. After experience had taught me that all the usual surroundings of social life are vain and futile, I finally resolved to inquire whether there might be some real good having power to communicate itself, which would affect the mind singly, to the exclusion of all else, whether, in fact, there might be anything, the discovery and attainment of which would enable me to enjoy continuous, supreme, and unending happiness. These words reveal a spirit which is found in many of the great philosophers, 
a sense that there must be something permanent, more meaningful, and more deeply satisfying than the usual pleasures of social life, politics, or business. Spinoza looks around at the citizens of Amsterdam and sees that most people focus their lives on the search for riches, for honor and fame, or for the pleasures of food, drink, and sex. He suggests that he himself has experienced his share of these things, but that they've left him unfulfilled. Not only are these pleasures unsatisfying in the long run, but they're a source of considerable trouble, even danger. There are many examples of people who have suffered persecution, even to death, for the sake of their riches, and of men who in pursuit of wealth have exposed themselves to so many dangers that they have paid away their lives as a penalty for their folly. Examples are no less numerous of men who have endured the utmost wretchedness for the sake of gaining or preserving their reputation. Lastly, there are innumerable cases of men who have hastened their death through overindulgence in sensual pleasure. Looking at the unhappiness around him and at the misery often brought by the search for wealth, power, and sensual pleasure, Spinoza noticed a pattern. It seems that our happiness depends upon the nature of the things that we love and devote ourselves to. If these things are inherently unstable and undependable, so too our happiness will be unstable and wavering. If the things we devote ourselves to can't reliably be controlled, then our own happiness will be hostage to the shifting winds of fortune, of the market, or of the opinion of others. In this aversion to fleeting and elusive goals, Spinoza agrees with the wisdom of the ancient Stoics. They held that most human misery occurs because people become emotionally attached to things which are easily lost and which are unreliable or perishable. Spinoza saw that the only way to achieve true and permanent happiness is to find something less changeable and more reliable to focus our love upon. So he embarked on a search for such a thing. Though not without some trepidation, he had no assurances that he'd find what he sought. But find it he did, and in the process Spinoza underwent a kind of transformation that he would later describe as liberation or salvation. What he found was as old as the most ancient religions and as modern as natural science. He called it God, but it had little in common with the Lord of Moses or the Trinity of the Christians. Baruch Spinoza's writings make important and original contributions in two different areas of philosophy. First is his account of God and his relationship to the world. This includes Spinoza's extended and detailed critique of traditional theology and religion. The second area is that which might be called Spinoza's moral psychology. That is, his account of how, through philosophical understanding, we might become better human beings and ultimately achieve permanent happiness, or, as he called it, blessedness. Spinoza's views on God and blessedness are closely related. He holds that we must overcome the prejudices and illusions of traditional theology if we are to gain the insight that makes blessedness possible. So the order of ideas themselves dictates the order in which they must be considered. First, God, then human beings and their happiness. Appropriately, Spinoza chose the title Concerning God for the first part of his most important work, The Ethics. In these pages, Spinoza describes his conception of the nature of God and criticizes traditional Judeo-Christian theology. These pages are among the densest and most difficult to understand in all of Western philosophy. While the general outlines of Spinoza's view were clear enough, scholars have argued for two centuries about the specifics. Our consideration of his philosophy must begin with those abstract metaphysical ideas which generations of scholars have found so difficult. But fortunately, once his general concept of God is understood, the thicket of abstractions dissolves and reveals a worldview that makes sense, makes sense of nature, of ourselves as part of nature. A philosophical vision emerges that provided Spinoza with the happiness he sought and which has seemed to many readers, from Coleridge to Einstein, to be as close to truth as philosophy has ever come. A great part of the difficulty in understanding Spinoza's main work stems from the way he wrote it, the actual structure of his exposition. 
Upon opening the ethics, the reader first notices not the revolutionary ideas, but the strange form in which Spinoza writes. First come definitions, then axioms, then a number of propositions, each one followed by a proof. The model for this kind of exposition is Euclid's classical text from the 4th century BC, entitled The Elements of Geometry. Spinoza presents his philosophical views as if he were writing a treatise in mathematics. He called this form of writing the geometrical method of demonstration, and its terse formality has intimidated many a potential reader. One 20th century commentator expressed his frustration this way. Spinoza's ethics is cast into geometrical form to make the thought Euclideanly clear. But the result is a laconic obscurity in which every line requires a Talmud of commentary. There are reasons why Spinoza chose this highly formal geometrical method for presenting his ideas, historical as well as philosophical reasons. Considering these reasons can help in understanding Spinoza's concept of God. Spinoza lived in the 17th century, a time imbued with a profound respect for mathematics. Galileo applied mathematics to the study of nature with startlingly successful results. Indeed, in a famous passage, Galileo declared that mathematics is the very language of nature itself. Philosophy is written in this grand book, the universe, which stands continually open to our gaze. But the book cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and read the letters in which it is composed. It is written in the language of mathematics, and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. Without these, one wanders in a dark labyrinth. Galileo had shown that mathematics, especially geometry, very successfully describes and explains natural phenomena. Indeed, in the 17th century, mathematics seemed in itself to be a perfect example of certain and indubitable knowledge. In Euclidean geometry, for example, everything follows with deductive certainty from the initial premises. Once we understand and accept the definitions and axioms, the truth of the theorem derived from them is beyond doubt. Spinoza believed that any well-ordered system of knowledge could be put into this sort of geometrical order with self-evident axioms and definitions and deductively certain theorems. It's not surprising, then, that in expounding his own systematic philosophy, Spinoza would choose to employ the geometrical method of demonstration. Though he surely knew that it doesn't make for easy reading, he thought the effort required of the reader would be rewarded by greater clarity and certainty. And there's more to Spinoza's choice of the geometrical method than just his desire for clarity. Historians of philosophy usually classify Spinoza as a rationalist. As a rule, rationalists believe that if we begin with genuinely clear, simple, and self-evidently true ideas, and if we carefully follow out the consequences of those ideas, we can develop a whole system of truths, all accurately reflecting reality. Euclid's geometry provides the classic example of such a project. He began with simple definitions and axioms, and from these he deduced an entire system of geometrical truths. The success of Euclid's project convinced the rationalists that knowledge can be had by following his procedure, by beginning with the simple and self-evident and deductively following out its consequences. If there's any question about the later propositions in Euclid's geometry, we can always trace the proposition back to its grounding in the initial premises. These premises, the definitions, axioms, and postulates, were thought to be so self-evident that they require no further justification. They are self-justifying. Spinoza wants his philosophy to have this kind of complete intelligibility and rational justification at all levels. But the difficulty in constructing a philosophical system of this kind is finding the right starting points, which must be simple and indubitable. Spinoza needs definitions which are intuitively clear and axioms which are self-evidently certain. As a rationalist, Spinoza is committed to a principle called the principle of sufficient reason. According to this principle, there's a reason or a cause for everything that exists and every event that occurs. Spinoza says, From a given definite cause, 
an effect necessarily follows, and on the other hand, if no definite cause be granted, it is impossible that an effect can follow. Furthermore, everything and every event can be and must be understood by referring to its cause. Axiom 4 of Part 1 of the Ethics addresses this by saying, The knowledge of an effect depends upon and involves the knowledge of its cause. In this statement, Spinoza makes it clear that our understanding of things must reflect the causal order of things. Now, in most cases, things and events are caused and thus explained by other prior things and events. And these prior things are caused and thus explained by still other things yet further back in the chain of causes. If there were no end to this chain of causes and explanations, then we would never arrive at a truly sufficient reason for anything, and there would be no final intelligibility to the world. If reality is to be intelligible, there must be something that needs no cause in order to exist, an explanation that does not require a further explanation. Such a thing, such an explanation, provides a beginning for the chain of causes and explanations, just as Euclid's self-evident definitions and axioms provide a beginning for geometry. This is Spinoza's starting point, something that can exist without a prior cause, an explanatory principle that needs no further explanation. This thing, which has no cause and needs no explanation, obviously provides an appropriate starting point for a systematic philosophy such as Spinoza's. The term he uses to refer to this starting point is substance. Substance is an age-old concept whose meaning has changed somewhat over the centuries, but it's long been at the heart of that branch of philosophy known as metaphysics. The sense in which Spinoza employs the term is similar to that of his predecessor in the 17th century, René Descartes. Descartes defined the term substance this way. A substance is a thing that so exists that it needs no other thing in order to exist. Now this is clearly the starting point that Spinoza was seeking, something that needs no other thing in order to exist. Substance is something whose existence does not depend upon a prior cause. This is the most basic principle in Spinoza's system, and the first part of the ethics develops at length the implications of this concept. He begins with a clear grasp of the concept of substance and follows its logic carefully. Ultimately, he finds only one thing can be independent of all else. He says, once we recognize that there can be only one such thing, we must also grant that everything else is ultimately caused by and dependent upon that one thing. Indeed, all things in the world are manifestations of the one first cause. Spinoza arrives at this sweeping conclusion by analyzing the very idea of substance. First, he argues that a being which requires nothing else for its existence must be an infinite being. If it were finite, then it would have some limits of some kind, since finite means limited. Any limited substance would have to be limited by some other thing. It couldn't be limited by nothing. But if a substance were limited by another thing, the other thing that limits it would partially determine what the substance is. But then the substance would not be independent of all other things, and hence it would not be a substance as we have defined it. Spinoza therefore concludes, Every substance is necessarily infinite. So far, Spinoza's been writing as if there may be more than one substance. But in fact, once we've established that any substance must be infinite, it's easy to show that there can be only one such substance. If someone now asks by what sign we shall be able to distinguish the diversity of substances, let him read the following propositions, which show that in nature there exists only one substance, and that it is absolutely infinite. So a sign would be sought in vain. It follows then. From the infinity of substance, there can be only one. If there were a second, separate and distinct from the first, then that second substance, being separate and distinct, would not be encompassed within the first. But there can't be anything that falls outside the compass of an infinite being, for the infinite being would then be limited. The infinite has no limits. So, one substance, there can be no more. This is a somewhat oversimplified version of Spinoza's argument he'll draw far-reaching conclusions from it, so it's important that we understand it. 
A modern reader will be tempted to ask here, what brought this substance about? If you ask that, though, you misunderstand the concept. Once again, if substance has its origin in anything else, anything at all, it is not substance. By definition, to exist, substance requires nothing else. Spinoza says of substance that it is its own cause. It is cause of itself. Now this sounds strange to us. We think of cause and effect as a relationship in which the cause precedes the effect. But the kind of causation which Spinoza is talking about is not related to time. Geometry again provides the best example of what Spinoza has in mind. The nature of a triangle is such that its angles always total 180 degrees. Spinoza would say that the nature of the triangle causes it to be true that the angles equal 180 degrees. But there's no time relationship here. The nature of a triangle does not temporally precede the fact that its angles total 180 degrees. The relationship is one of logical implication. It follows from the nature of the triangle that its angles total 180 degrees. But this following from does not involve time. The relationship is like the relationship which holds between the premises and the conclusion of a valid argument. A conclusion follows from the premises. There is no time involved. In saying that substance is the cause of itself, Spinoza is saying that its existence follows from its own nature. It pertains to the nature of a substance to exist. In other words, a non-existent substance is inconceivable, in the same way that it's inconceivable that the angles of a Euclidean triangle do not equal 180 degrees. Its existence follows necessarily from its own nature. Substance is singular. Substance is infinite. Substance is the cause and source of its own being, and substance is eternal as the timeless truths of mathematics are eternal. Having demonstrated these truths, Spinoza doesn't shy away from the next step. Religious thinkers, such as the great philosopher-theologian Thomas Aquinas, had traditionally used the name God to refer to the infinite and eternal first cause. Since Spinoza has shown that, in fact, substance fits this description, he concludes that the one substance is God. His identification of God with substance is a key point in his philosophy, and he uses it to draw startling conclusions in quick succession. First, since an infinite God is all-encompassing, nothing can exist outside of this God. And since things, in order to be understood rightly, must be conceived through their causes, we can understand all things by referring to God as their ultimate cause. Spinoza concludes in Proposition 15 of the Ethics. Whatever is, is in God, and nothing can be or be conceived without God. There can be no limitations to the infinite. Thus, the power of God, or substance, must be unlimited. Hence, he says, From God's supreme power, infinitely many things, in infinitely many ways, that is to say, all things, have necessarily flowed, or always followed, by the same necessity and in the same way. As from the nature of a triangle it follows, from eternity and to eternity, that its three angles are equal to two right angles. Finally, since all things are in God, God must be thought of as an imminent indwelling cause. The power of God is present everywhere as the indwelling cause of all things. Spinoza's concept of the relationship between God and the world is unusual. All things are in God, and the power of God is present everywhere as the indwelling cause of all things. In Spinoza's technical vocabulary, the relationship between God and the world is the relationship between substance and its modes. Substance, we remember, is that which depends on nothing else for its existence. Modes, on the other hand, are defined as things which are not capable of existing on their own, but whose existence depends on something else. In philosophy, the word mode is a technical term deriving from the Latin word modus. In ordinary Latin, it means manner or way. According to Spinoza, every individual thing in the world, every physical thing and every action or idea is a mode. Every individual thing is a certain manner or way in which the power of God is manifest. God is active, and this activity is his continuing self-expression of the world at every moment. 
In Spinoza's view, the world is God's infinite and eternal power, expressing itself in infinitely many ways or modes. In a sense, then, God and nature are one. Spinoza sometimes emphasizes this by referring to the one substance as God or nature, two names for the same thing. Though Spinoza doesn't distinguish between God and nature, he does draw a distinction between the divine active power which underlies and expresses itself as things and the things that this power produces. He calls the active power natura naturans, or in English, nature naturing. He calls the things produced by that power's activity natura naturata, or nature natured. A helpful analogy for understanding this distinction, though it's only an analogy, is to think of God's activity as a dance. When we waltz, it's an activity, dancing. But this activity is also a thing, a dance. So too, God's activity, expressing himself, is nature naturing, nature's active process of self-creation. The world, viewed as a thing produced by that activity, is nature natured, the world nature has created of itself. God's indwelling active self-expression as the world is viewed here through two different lenses. Our dance analogy can be helpful in understanding one further characteristic of Spinoza's view. Dancing is a structured, patterned activity. So too the divine activity is structured in regular, patterned ways. Since God is infinite and timeless, these regularities of God's activity do not change. Spinoza says, Nature's laws and ordinances, whereby all things come to pass and change from one form to another, are everywhere and always the same. When scientists such as Galileo try to discover the laws of nature, they are in fact discovering these timeless regularities of God's activity. All things and all events in nature are causally related and are determined to exist and occur in accordance with the laws of nature. Thus, when Spinoza claims that God's nature is singular and all-encompassing, he's also saying that all things are part of a single, unified, all-inclusive causal system. In nature there is nothing contingent, but all things have been determined from the necessity of the divine nature to exist and produce an effect in a certain way. Spinoza argues, too, that since natural laws follow from the infinite and eternal nature of God, more of substance, nothing in the world could possibly be different from the way it is. Things could have been produced by God in no other way and in no other order than they have been produced, for all things have necessarily followed from God's given nature and have been determined by the necessity of God's nature to exist and to produce an effect in a certain way. This is Spinoza's unusual concept of God and of the way the world flows from his infinite power. It's a difficult, abstract concept, still much debated by scholars today. Already we can begin to see why certain romantic poets, for whom nature was divine, would find a kindred spirit in Spinoza. It's also clear why scientifically-minded thinkers such as Einstein would be drawn to his belief that the universe is orderly, that all things are causally related in a unified system according to the laws of nature. The view that all things are in God, and that God is the indwelling cause of all things, would later lead some 18th century readers to claim that Spinoza was a pantheist, that is, someone who believes that all things are God. In his own day, however, Spinoza was most often accused of being an atheist. Even in the Netherlands, a country known for its tolerance of religious differences, the charge of atheism was a serious one. Opposing the tenets of traditional orthodoxy was a dangerous undertaking which could lead to prison or worse, and Spinoza's views were clearly not those of the orthodox synagogue or the reformed church. But were the clerics fair in labeling Spinoza an atheist? On the one hand, he claimed that without God, nothing can either be or be conceived, so it seems absurd to accuse him of atheism. On the other hand, Spinoza's God is not the God of Moses and Abraham. Spinoza's substance has little in common with the divine potentate or the heavenly father of traditional Judeo-Christian theology. Here lies much of the originality of Spinoza's position, and in this originality lies much of what offended the clergy. 
If Spinoza's originality is to be recognized, it's important to contrast his concept of God with more traditional views. Fortunately, he's made this easy in two ways. In his discussion in part one of the ethics, Spinoza often pauses to argue against more traditional views. Moreover, knowing orthodox theology is based upon scripture, he wrote an entire work justifying his interpretation of the Bible. These are the parts of Spinoza's work that we'll turn to for a deeper understanding of his conception of God. In the 17th century, common Judeo-Christian tradition held that God, exercising his free will, had decided some thousands of years ago to create the world. Spinoza thinks that virtually every aspect of this traditional account is demonstrably false. He gives reasons for his conclusions. First, the biblical account is anthropomorphic. That is, it attributes human characteristics to God. Second, this view suggests that God has purposes, makes decisions, and possesses something called free will. Third, tradition views the creation as having occurred at a specific time in the past. Finally, the biblical account suggests that God is distinct from his creation. Spinoza explicitly argues against the traditional view on each of these points. In retrospect, it's no wonder that both Jewish and Christian defenders of the faith were hostile to his philosophy. Their most deeply held convictions about God, morality, and human salvation were based upon the anthropomorphic concept of God they found in the Bible. In denying the existence of such a God, Spinoza seemed to be denying the truth of Holy Scripture itself. The Calvinist clergy's disagreement with Spinoza also involved more than theology alone. In the Netherlands, as in all of Europe during the 17th century, religion was inextricably bound up with struggles for political power. As we will see, to understand the hostility of the church towards Spinoza's views is to understand something of the political situation in the Netherlands in the middle of the 17th century. When Spinoza was writing in the 1660s, a century and a half had passed since Luther sparked the Reformation in Germany. This had been a century and a half of ceaseless war and strife between Catholics and Protestants all over Europe. The provinces of the Low Countries had not been spared the destruction and bloodshed wrought by the wars of religion. In fact, the very existence of a country called the Netherlands resulted from a protracted 40-year revolt in which the Low Country provinces won their independence from the Habsburg Empire. Philip II, who'd ruled over the Netherlands from his capital in Spain, had been a staunch Roman Catholic. He'd viewed every deviation from Catholic orthodoxy as a treasonous affront to his sovereignty. His unwillingness to permit Calvinists and other Protestants to worship openly within the lands of his empire was a major cause of the province's war for independence. But as so often happens, once independence was won, the Calvinists themselves began agitating to have all forms of religious service other than their own outlawed in their new republic. By the middle of the 17th century, there were two clearly opposing factions in Dutch politics. On the one hand, there were the Republicans, as they were called, led by Jan de Witt. De Witt and his Republicans supported the governmental status quo and favored religious and intellectual freedom. On the other side were the monarchists, backed by the clergy who wanted William of Orange to be king and wanted to establish Calvinism as the official state church. Spinoza supported the Republicans, and there's some evidence that he and de Witt were personal friends. In the early 1660s, de Witt was comfortably in control of the government, and all seemed well. But the preachers were always on hand in times of trouble to tell their congregations that the nation's problems were a sign of God's displeasure with the heresies in their midst. From his letters, it's clear that Spinoza was working full-time on the ethics from 1663 to 1665. But a letter from a friend written in September of 65 indicates that Spinoza had begun a new project. I see that you are not so much philosophizing as, if I may say so, theologizing. For you are writing down your thoughts about angels, prophecy, and miracles. Apparently the correspondent had learned that Spinoza had broken off his work in the ethics and begun a work with the imposing title Tractatus Theologico Politicus a theological political treatise. Spinoza wrote back, explaining, I am now writing a treatise about my interpretation of Scripture. This I am driven to do for the following reasons. Firstly, 
the prejudices of the theologians, for I know that these are among the chief obstacles which prevent men from directing their mind to philosophy. Secondly, the opinion which the common people have of me, who do not cease to accuse me falsely of atheism. Thirdly, the freedom of philosophizing and of saying what we think. This I desire to vindicate in every way, for here it is always suppressed through the excessive authority and impudence of the preachers. By defending the freedom of thought and expression against the agitation of the clergy, Spinoza was taking a clear stand in favor of the Republicans on the major political issue of his time. The clergymen based their claims on the authority of Scripture, which was seen as divinely inspired and literally and infallibly true. Spinoza knew that to get to the root of these claims, he'd have to investigate the Bible itself in order to ascertain just what authority it has and what doctrines it teaches. So he undertook a full-scale interpretive study of the scriptures and produced what is now recognized as the first example of modern critical biblical scholarship. This approach does not rely on the clergy or on tradition for interpretation. It studies the Bible as an historical document using the methods of the literary scholar, the linguist, the historian, and the anthropologist. Spinoza was in a good position to undertake such a study, for he knew the Hebrew language well. He also was thoroughly familiar from his childhood days with the part of the Bible written in Hebrew. Devoting himself entirely to his task, Spinoza set aside the ethics and spent five years of his life studying the scriptures and recording his interpretation of what he found. The preface to Spinoza's theological political treatise reminds the reader that in all ages, despotic rulers and demagogues have used superstition, wrapped in the garb of religion, to control the minds and hearts of the multitudes. Spinoza points out that the true teachings of Christianity regrettably have been distorted into pretexts for war and sectarian strife. I have often wondered that people who make a boast of professing the Christian religion, namely love, joy, peace, and charity to all men, should quarrel with such rancorous animosity and display daily toward one another such bitter hatred that this rather than the virtues they claim, is the readiest criterion of their faith. As different clerics tried to outdo one another in claiming unquestionable divine authority for their difficult doctrines, the people naturally became confused. Spinoza notes that since religious doctrines are so often utterly contrary to reason, the clerics had to argue that divine truth is contrary to our God-given powers of reason. Faith has become a mere compound of credulity and prejudices. Aye, prejudices too, which degrade man from rational being to beast, which completely stifle the power of judgment between true and false, which seem, in fact, carefully fostered for the purpose of extinguishing the last spark of reason. Piety great God, and religion are become a tissue of ridiculous mysteries. Men who flatly despise reason, who reject and turn away from understanding as naturally corrupt, these, I say, these of all men are thought, oh lie most horrible, to possess light from on high. Noting that most of these dangerous men claim scriptural authority for their divisive doctrines, Spinoza describes his own intentions. I determined to examine the Bible afresh, in a careful, impartial, and unfettered spirit, making no assumptions concerning it, and attributing to it no doctrines which I do not find clearly therein set down. With these precautions, I constructed a method of scriptural interpretation, and thus equipped, proceeded to inquire. Proceeding, he says, as a scientist would, Spinoza undertakes to compare different parts of the Bible, noting similarities and contrasts in what is said, and trying to understand the intentions of the authors of the text. Much stands in the way of such a project, he admits. For example, ancient Hebrew had no vowels and no punctuation, so it often admits of more than one reading. 
Also, to interpret a text with confidence, we need to know who wrote it, at what time, and under what circumstances. Unfortunately, many of these facts about the Bible are not known. Interpretation is difficult without having all the relevant historical information, but Spinoza attempts to find a meaningful and faithful reading by attending carefully to the text itself. A key issue regarding the Bible, of course, is the question of its status as divine revelation. That is, whether the Bible is the word of God or of men. Traditional claims of its uniquely divine status usually rest on two considerations. First, prophets are credited with divine authority as sources of revelation. Second, the reported miracles are believed to verify the presence of the divine and to give special weight to the words of the miracle worker. Spinoza discusses each of these at length, beginning with prophecy. Spinoza notes that only Moses is explicitly said to have directly heard the voice of God. The other prophets are said to have received their messages in dreams or visions, or as the Spirit of God came upon them. The imagination is obviously active in dreams and visions, and Spinoza explains at length that the Hebrew word which is translated as spirit is a word with many meanings, including breath, habit of mind, and even life itself. Now, Spinoza is happy to grant that the power of God is manifest in the knowledge of the prophets, for, as we've seen, he believes that all things, including all human thoughts, are manifestations of the power of God. He emphasizes the role that imagination plays in the visions and pronouncements of the prophets in order to point out that the voice of a prophet is not itself the voice of God. It's the voice of a human being expressing godly truth as he has understood it, subject to his own accustomed ways of thinking and of imagining. This view suggests that the prophets are distinguished from other people by the greater vividness of their imaginations and the greater force of their verbal powers of expression. The fact that the imagination plays an important role in the revelations of the prophets suggests to Spinoza that their pronouncements are influenced by their personal differences in background and intellect. Hence, Spinoza believes that they shouldn't be taken as totally reliable authorities on theoretical or speculative questions, nor did the prophets know all things, as some clerics have tried to claim. Everyone has been strangely hasty in affirming that the prophets knew everything within the scope of human intellect, and Although certain passages of Scripture plainly affirm that the prophets were in certain respects ignorant, such persons would rather say that they do not understand the passages than admit that there was anything which the prophets did not know. Relying on his stated method of looking to the Bible itself, Spinoza cites a number of passages which indicate that the prophets were ignorant of certain matters of mathematics, astronomy, and theology. He then cites instances in which they differed with one another in ways which seem most easily explained by individual differences in their personal backgrounds and their accustomed ways of thinking and imagining. So did the revelation vary according to individual disposition and temperament, and according to the opinions previously held. If a prophet was cheerful in disposition, victories, peace, and events which make men glad were revealed to him. If, on the other hand, he was melancholy, wars, massacres, and calamities were revealed. Spinoza notes that the different prophets had different methods of forecasting the future. Even the style of prophecy varied according to the eloquence of the prophet. As Spinoza puts it, The prophecies of Ezekiel and Amos are not written in a cultivated style like those of Isaiah and Nahum. Finally, the scripture reveals that the prophets differed with one another in the actual content of their revelations and the symbols they used to express them. Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord departing from the temple in a different form from that presented to Ezekiel. Isaiah saw seraphim with six wings, Ezekiel beasts with four wings. Isaiah saw God clothed and sitting on a royal throne. Ezekiel saw him in the likeness of a fire. Each, doubtless, saw God in the form in which he usually imagined him. 
Spinoza might sound as if he's trying to undermine the credibility of everything the prophets proclaimed, but he says he only wants to distinguish the kernel of divine truth in their utterances from the imaginative form used to express them. Spinoza believes that for all their obvious differences, the prophets agree about morality and about the way that people should live with each other. The fundamental truths of the scriptures are moral truths. But these truths are expressed as unusual visions and oracles in ways congenial to the imaginations of the prophets and likely to stir the imaginations of their listeners. Our greatest danger, Spinoza believes, is the tendency to confuse the imaginative garb of prophecy with the moral truth it's intended to convey. This tendency takes imaginative visions to be divinely guaranteed truths about theological, speculative, or scientific matters. The ethical teachings of prophecy are clear enough to everyone, including the uneducated. But Spinoza believes when learned theologians argue about the nature of God based on their differing interpretations of prophetic visions, only confusion and discord can result. Having discussed prophecy, Spinoza turns his attention to the second authority often used to support the scriptures. The Bible claims that miracles were performed to show the presence of God and supposedly to demonstrate the divine authority of the miracle worker. Interpreting the miracle stories is a difficult matter. Much depends on the meaning of the word miracle. Miracles are most often taken to be events that are contrary to the laws of nature. As we've seen, Spinoza's philosophy says the laws of nature follow necessarily and immutably from the eternal essence of God. From this perspective, it's strictly impossible that any event could contradict the laws of nature. In his view, miracles cannot occur. But in the Tractatus, the theological political treatise, Spinoza's resolved to focus on the scriptures themselves so he can't elaborate on his own non-biblical view. Therefore, he cites a number of passages in which the scriptures themselves declare that God is immutable and unchangeable. In part, he bases his argument against miracles on these passages. More importantly, though, Spinoza argues that only our human prejudice makes us believe that a few ostensibly miraculous events provide more evidence of God's power than the constant orderly working of nature we see all the time. He says nature provides the best evidence we could possibly have that an eternal and omnipotent God exists. The masses think that the power and providence of God are most clearly displayed by events that are extraordinary and contrary to the conception they have formed of nature. They think that the clearest possible proof of God's existence is afforded when nature as they suppose, breaks her accustomed order. They suppose that God is inactive so long as nature works in her accustomed order, and vice versa, that the power of nature and natural causes are idle so long as God is acting. Thus they imagine two powers, distinct from one another, the power of God and the power of nature what they mean by either, and what they understand by God and nature, they do not know, except that they imagine the power of God to be like that of some royal potentate. Spinoza, of course, holds that the laws of nature always and everywhere express the eternal, infinite power of God. Should anything happen contrary to nature, it would be evidence that God's power and constancy had lapsed. This, he holds, is impossible. Concluding his discussion of miracles, Spinoza points out that the Jews and the early Christians, being pious people and knowing little of the laws of nature, often referred to things as being done by God. Their way of speaking sometimes suggests miraculous divine intervention, when in fact they intended nothing of the sort. Hence, when the Bible says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, it only means that Pharaoh was obstinate. When it says that God opened the windows of heaven, it only means that it rained very hard, and so on. Spinoza says events reported as miracles are actually natural events that people of the time couldn't understand. 
the events seemed explainable only by supernatural intervention. But, as Spinoza sees it, all events in nature are, in a sense, acts of God. Thus, all events attest to his power and glory. Miracles are almost, by definition, things that we don't understand. And Spinoza believes we can't gain knowledge, knowledge of God or anything else, from things we don't understand. He does feel, though, that reports of miracles serve a purpose. Like the dramatic visions of the prophets, reports of miracles impress on the people's imagination those profound lessons the prophets, Jesus, and the apostles were teaching. These wise yet simple lessons are about morals and ethics, about the best way to live and the importance of loving God and your neighbor. As we'll see, Spinoza believes these lessons are essential to human happiness. They're truths which can be known by everyone through the power of reason. But most people are more moved by appeals to the imagination, by wonders and strange occurrences. So the great spiritual teachers have framed their messages to teach the minds and the hearts of their hearers. Spinoza adds that these teachers who taught peace and piety certainly didn't want rancorous disagreement, even war, about minute interpretation of theological and scriptural questions. Spinoza argues that the important lessons in the scriptures are quite plain to anyone who reads the text with an open and reverent mind. The scriptures can't be considered authoritative on matters of science or even of speculative theology. On these matters, the Bible's authors were, not surprisingly, often either silent or in disagreement with one another. Spinoza suggests that people who use the scriptures to foment discord or gain power over others are clearly not acting in the service of the living God. Indeed, such people undermine the sacredness of the scripture itself by misusing it. A thing is called sacred and divine when it is designed for promoting piety and continues sacred so long as it is religiously used. If the users cease to be pious, the thing ceases to be sacred. If it be turned to base uses, that which was formerly sacred becomes unclean and profane. Based on his reading of the scriptures, Spinoza concludes that the purpose of true religion is to promote virtue and encourage people to live piously and peacefully with one another. Most arguments about theology, doctrine, and ritual have nothing to do with virtue or peaceful living, so Spinoza maintains that the government shouldn't take sides in these arguments. The government should allow its citizens to believe and worship freely as they will. Thus, the first truly modern critical study of the Bible ends with a plea for religious freedom and tolerance. Spinoza warns us what will happen if one religious group gains control of the government's power. They will not scruple to assert that they have been directly chosen by God and that their laws are divine, whereas the laws of the state are human and should therefore yield obedience to the laws of God, in other words, to their own laws. Everyone must see that this is not a state of affairs conducive to public welfare. The arguments of the Tractatus are numerous and subtle. Only a few of them have been briefly summarized here. Spinoza hoped his work might serve to calm religious strife and encourage simple piety. He also wanted to strengthen the political position of the Republicans led by De Witt, who favored religious freedom for the Netherlands. By the time the Tractatus was published in 1670, though, the political situation was much worse. The Netherlands were at war, and many people were clamoring for William of Orange to take control. In this near hysterical climate, it wasn't safe to publish the Tractatus openly, so it appeared anonymously, with its place of publication falsely listed as Hamburg in Germany. But hostile critics soon identified the true author, and the work was viciously attacked. One especially venomous critic called it an evil implement. It is forged in hell by a renegade Jew and the devil, and issued with the knowledge of Mr. De Witt. There was no chance that Spinoza's vision of peace and piety would be realized under these circumstances. Two years later, De Witt and his brother were lynched by an angry mob. Their mutilated bodies were hung from a pole. William of Orange was installed as the stateholder. 
The clerics gained influence not long after publication and sales of Spinoza's Tractatus Theologico Politicus was officially banned in the Netherlands. Spinoza's efforts to influence the politics of his own time were unsuccessful. His theological views were too far from the mainstream to gain many adherents. His critical and scholarly approach to the Bible was an affront to the fundamentalists. His hopes for a state in which there would be freedom of thought and religion were too progressive for the middle of the 17th century. But time passes. Views which seem radical to one age can become common sense in another. A century later, the United States Constitution would codify the freedoms of speech, of the press, and religion as basic principles of our government. Two centuries later, historically sensitive theologians would adopt many of Spinoza's methods and conclusions as the basis for scholarly biblical study. We've also seen that the vision of God's immanent presence in nature found adherence in the Romantic poets. And we've seen that scientists since then have embraced Spinoza's view that nature is a single unified system in which every event is causally determined. In many ways, his views have been vindicated by history. But perhaps we should remember that vindication was less important to Spinoza than what he called liberation or salvation. His goal was to find the way to happiness. I resolved to inquire whether there might be some real good the discovery and attainment of which would enable me to enjoy continuous, supreme, and unending happiness. Spinoza believed that in his doctrine of God he'd discovered the foundation for the happiness he sought. But we've seen that according to his view there is no heavenly father, there is no human free will, and the universe has no purpose. How could such a view provide the deep happiness Spinoza sought? For answer, we must turn to the other fields of philosophy where he made original and lasting contributions, the fields of ethics and moral psychology. This is the end of Volume 1. The presentation is continued on Volume 2. According to Spinoza, all things in the world manifest the eternal power and activity of God, who is synonymous with nature. God is omnipresent, an indwelling power which we find in the natural order. Nothing happens by chance in this world for all things are determined according to the laws of divine nature. Nothing happens in this world for any divine purpose. God's active self-expression has no purpose. According to Spinoza, this is the world as reason reveals it to us, purposeless, deterministic, and governed by natural laws that were not ordained with our well-being in mind. And as reason reveals what the world's like, Reason can also reveal how we should live in such a world if we're to find happiness, and in Spinoza's terms, salvation. Immediately after describing this basic character of reality, Spinoza reminds us that he has a practical purpose. I pass now to explaining those things which must necessarily follow from the essence of God, or the infinite and eternal being. Not indeed all of them, for we have demonstrated that infinitely many things must follow from it in infinitely many ways, but only those that can lead us by the hand, as it were, to the knowledge of the human mind and its highest blessedness. Spinoza emphasizes the importance of understanding the human mind for a number of reasons. First, he's interested in questions about knowledge, as all philosophers are. How much do we know? What are the sources of our ignorance and of our mistakes? These questions can't be answered without understanding something about the nature of the mind itself. Second, and more importantly, Spinoza emphasizes an understanding of the mind because happiness and unhappiness are states of mind. He holds that in order to understand our greatest happiness, our highest blessedness, we must understand our own minds. Thus, the second part of Spinoza's ethics is called of the nature and origin of the mind. Questions about the human mind are as old as philosophy itself. It seems obvious enough that human beings have both a body and a mind, but just what the mind is and how it's related to the body is profoundly mysterious. Spinoza holds that God's infinite power must be expressed in infinitely many ways. 
As we saw, this means in part that there is an infinite series of modes, all causally related in a single natural system. But Spinoza also holds that in addition to the modes themselves, there must be infinitely many ways in which this series of modes is expressed. There are infinitely many ways in which the power of God and the modes that flow from that power can be conceived. These ways are called attributes. Spinoza doesn't say why, but for some reason we're capable of grasping only two of these attributes, thought and extension. In this way he argues that mental things and physical things are not different substances, but different ways in which the one substance is expressed different ways in which we can conceive the orderly series of modes. This view has powerful consequences for understanding the mind and the body, so it's important that we make it clear. Spinoza is claiming that God's power is expressed as an infinite ordered series of modes under the attribute of thought, and is also expressed as an infinite ordered series of modes under the attribute of extension. The modes, when conceived through the attribute of thought, are known as ideas. When conceived through the attribute of extension, they're known as physical things. But Spinoza emphasizes that this distinction between the attributes does not mean that there are two substances. The thinking substance and extended substance are one and the same substance, which is now comprehended under this attribute, now under that. So also, a mode of extension and the idea of that mode are one and the same thing, but expressed in two ways. It follows, then, that the causal order found among the modes of extension will be reflected in the ordered series of ideas. Spinoza confirms this. The order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. This means that for every mode of extension, every physical object in the world, there's an exactly corresponding mode of thought. There's an idea of that object. Spinoza sometimes speaks of all the modes of thought together as the intellect of God, or even the mind of God. But we must always remember that terms like the mind of God refer to the infinite order of modes under the attribute of thought in order corresponding exactly to the order of modes under the attribute of extension. You could say that the order of material things and the order of ideas run exactly parallel with each other, but that would be a little misleading since these are not two different orders, but one order of modes expressed in two different ways. One order of modes is expressed as physical objects and as ideas of those objects. Spinoza was not a materialist. He didn't believe that mind somehow arises from matter, though some have mistakenly interpreted him this way. Nor did he believe that material nature is really mental, though some have misread him in this as well. Spinoza believed that mind and matter are two different ways in which the ordered activity of substance is manifest. Having thus laid the groundwork, Spinoza is ready to address the question of the human mind. The mind, according to him, is made up of ideas. It's not a thing which has ideas. The mind is ideas. Certain ideas, certain modes of substance expressed through the attribute of thought. Spinoza draws the necessary conclusion. From this it follows that the human mind is a part of the infinite intellect of God. Therefore, when we say that the human mind perceives this or that, we are saying nothing but that God not in so far as he is infinite, but in so far as he constitutes the human mind, has this or that idea. Our minds are parts of the infinite mind of God. But the emphasis here must be on the word part, for God has infinitely many ideas. God has an idea of each thing in the universe, but our minds consist of only a few of those ideas. Which ones? Which of God's ideas constitute your mind or my mind? According to Spinoza, the ideas that constitute your mind are the ideas of your body. Each individual's mind is made up of those of God's ideas that are the ideas of that individual's body. Spinoza provides a basic theory of what the human body is like and how it differs from other bodies. 
His theory is heavily influenced by the science of his time, but it's also highly original in describing how living organisms are different from other physical things. In Spinoza's view, the physical universe is made up of infinitely many small corpuscles, rather like atoms, which he refers to as simplest bodies. These simplest bodies are either in motion or at rest, and their motion or rest is determined by their interactions with other simple bodies around them. You get the image of lots of little particles bouncing off one another, determining each other's movements based on the laws of physical motion and geometry. This is all at the level of the smallest bodies, or what might be called the micro-level. Our own bodies and the things most familiar to us are larger, more complex physical things that are made up of many simple small bodies. Spinoza calls these macro-scale things composite bodies. He explains them somewhat technically as follows. When a number of bodies of the same or different magnitude form close contact with one another through the pressure of other bodies upon them, or if they are moving at the same time or different rates of speed so as to preserve an unvarying relation of movement among themselves, these bodies are said to be united with one another, and all together to form one body or individual thing which is distinguished from other things through this union of bodies. So, a composite body exists when its parts maintain an unvarying relation of movement among themselves. This means when a man walks across the street, he remains the same individual even though his physical position has changed. The parts that make up his body all move together, maintaining the same positions and motions relative to one another. And even though today's scientists tell us that the cells that make up our bodies are replaced every few years, still we remain the same individuals, for the cells generally maintain a constant position and motion relative to one another throughout all of the replacements. Spinoza says that every individual thing in the universe endeavors to maintain its own characteristic internal relations of motion, even as it undergoes different changes and influences. Indeed, this tendency to preserve physical integrity is what characterizes the individual physical thing as an individual. Spinoza calls this endeavor for self-preservation a thing's individual essence. He says, Everything, insofar as it is in itself, endeavors to persist in its own being. This endeavor is nothing else but the actual essence of the thing in question. This tendency toward self-preservation is nothing strange or magical. It's just the way the laws of nature work together to produce and maintain physical objects and living organisms. Spinoza emphasizes that what can be viewed as a whole individual from one perspective can also be seen as just a part of a greater individual when viewed from the larger perspective. And if we proceed in this way to infinity, we shall easily conceive that the whole of nature is one individual whose parts, that is, all bodies, vary in infinite ways without any change of the whole individual. This is Spinoza's remarkably modern view of the physical world. The world's an infinitely large totality made up of parts which in turn are made up of smaller parts all the way down to the simplest, smallest particles. The human body in this view is a middle-sized composite body, a complex, finite mode of substance expressed through the attribute of extension. Like all other physical things, it's characterized both by a constant relative motion and rest among its parts and by an endeavor to maintain its physical integrity in the surrounding environment. The body constantly interacts with things around it. Some of these interactions are essential to its survival, such as food or oxygen. The human body needs for its preservation a great many other bodies, by which, as it were, it is continually regenerated. Some of the body's interactions with other things threaten its survival, for example, encountering wild beasts or drinking poison and many interactions alter the body slightly without contributing either to its survival or its demise. As noted earlier, Spinoza holds that this entire complex physical order is also expressed as an order of ideas under the attribute of thought. 
The human mind, he says, is the complex idea of the human body, and the mind stands in the same causal relation to other ideas as the body stands to other physical things. When the body is influenced or affected by anything in the environment, the mind is likewise influenced or affected by the idea of that thing. Since the human body can be affected in many ways by many things, so too our minds can be affected by very many ideas of other things. And as we'll see, herein lies the basis of Spinoza's account of human error and human knowledge. We may recall that in Spinoza's view, our minds are, in a sense, part of the mind of God. The ideas that constitute our minds are the ideas of our bodies. They are part of the infinite order of modes under the attribute of thought. Now, since all of these ideas are exact mental reflections of physical reality, it might seem as if all the ideas in our minds would be true ideas. But, of course, that's just not the case. We don't have only true ideas. Spinoza must explain how it is that we often hold false beliefs. The explanation is to be found in the fact that our first ideas are ideas about how our bodies are affected and modified by other things. Spinoza realizes that sense experience provides our first conscious awareness of the world. The sense organs, the eyes, ears, tongue, nose, and skin, are stimulated by things around us. These stimulations of the sensory organs, and consequently the brain, are reflected in our minds as different ideas, such as light, taste, or sound. These ideas arising from our senses make us aware of ourselves and the world, but they're highly unreliable as sources of knowledge. Perceptual ideas don't reveal the world to us as it truly is, but only as it happens to affect our senses. For example, our eyes are not sensitive enough to see the minute parts that make things up, nor do our senses reveal how things are caused by other things, according to the laws of nature. Moreover, we see things only from a single limited perspective. It's no wonder that sense perception fails to give us full knowledge of the things of the world. Spinoza emphasizes the way the constitution of our own sense organs, of our own bodies, colors our perception of other things. From this it follows, first, that the human mind perceives the nature of a great many bodies together with the nature of its own. It follows, second, that the ideas which we have of external bodies indicate the condition of our own body more than the nature of the external bodies. When you look at another person, you have a perceptual image, an image that you call an idea of that person. But this doesn't reveal very much about that other person. In fact, your image is not directly an idea of that person at all. Your image is actually an idea of the way in which your body, your senses, are affected by that other person. The makeup of the other person is mixed together with the makeup of your own body in a confused way. Spinoza claims that the partiality and confusion characteristic of our perceptual ideas are the source of all error in our thinking. His account of perception explains why we seem to have ideas that are not true, even though our minds are made up of God's ideas, all of which are true. As we've discussed, our perceptual idea of another person is a true and accurate idea of the way in which our senses are affected by that other person, but it's only a confused, partial idea of that person. Spinoza calls all ideas derived from sense perception inadequate ideas. They're inadequate in that they confuse the nature of our own bodies with the nature of other things. Spinoza refers to inadequate ideas as imagination, or knowledge of the first kind. It's important to note that when he uses the word imagination, he's not only referring to what we call imagination today. For him, all sense perception is imagination. It provides us with mere images of things, not the nature of those things or the causes which produced them. When we look at the sun, we imagine it as about 200 feet away from us, an error which does not consist simply in this imagining, but in the fact that while we imagine it in this way, we are ignorant of its true distance and of the cause of this imagining. 
For even if we later come to know that the sun is more than 600 diameters of the earth away from us, we nevertheless imagine it as near. For we imagine the sun so near not because we do not know its true distance, but because a modification of our body involves the sun only insofar as our body is affected by the sun. This passage illustrates a number of points. We believe that our perceptual idea accurately indicates the distance between us and the sun because we're ignorant about how perceptual ideas are formed. If we learn more about optics, astronomy, and the physiology of the eye, we might no longer be in error. We would know our perception doesn't give us an accurate idea of the sun. But our perceptual idea wouldn't disappear because we know more about its causes. It was and remains an accurate idea of the way in which our eyes are affected by the sun. The ideas of the imagination are not false in any absolute sense. They're just incomplete and fragmentary because they don't comprehend their place in the overall causal order of nature. Spinoza claims that all falsity in our ideas is really just a matter of such incompleteness and confusion. Falsity consists in the privation of knowledge which inadequate or confused ideas involve. Spinoza uses this account of inadequate perception to explain what today we would call imagination. For example, when the image of a friend lingers in your mind even after she's no longer in the room with you, Spinoza believes this is simply because your brain retains an image until something causes it to change. As Spinoza says, If the human body is affected in a way that involves the nature of some external thing, the human mind will regard that same external thing as present to itself until the human body undergoes a further modification which excludes the presence of the said thing. Like most other rationalists, Spinoza profoundly mistrusts the things we learn from the senses. After all, our perceptual knowledge is mediated by our body, which reveals things to our mind only through our body's own idiosyncratic ways. And of course, the human body is just one finite mode located in one specific place. It's capable of perceiving things only in the ways and in the sequence it encounters those things. Moreover, Spinoza says the body can form only a limited number of clear images at one time. The human body, being limited, is capable of forming simultaneously in itself only a certain number of distinct images. If this number be exceeded, these images begin to be confused, and if it be far exceeded, all the images will be utterly confused with one another. It's not surprising that we can gain no accurate, complete, or objective knowledge of things from such questionable sources as our own fallible bodies. Spinoza sums up his view of the matter by pointing out that if the mind knows things only through sense perception, its understanding is weak. So long as the human mind perceives things only from the common order of nature, it does not have adequate knowledge of itself, nor of its body, nor of external bodies, but only a confused and fragmentary knowledge. He says that most of the errors and mistakes of past thinkers can be explained as confusion caused by the imagination. For example, medieval thinkers following Plato relied on the notion of general essences to explain things. They thought that all horses share a common essence, call it horsehood, which explains why they're all horses. Spinoza rejects this. He explains that these thinkers developed such ideas because the body is not sensitive enough to register all the slight differences among various horses. The mind forms a distinct image only of what they all have in common. Thus, horsehood doesn't correspond to anything in nature, but only to a confused and indistinct image. No wonder medieval philosophers argued endlessly about these essences. Each person will form universal images of things according to the dispositions of his body. Hence it is not surprising that so many controversies have arisen among the philosophers who have sought to explain natural things by mere images of things. 
Earlier we noted Spinoza's view that theologians and prophets often disagree with one another because they have different imaginations and therefore differing images of the divine. Now that we better understand his concept of the imagination, we can see why disagreements of this kind come up in philosophy and theology. In light of all the confusion and disagreement blamed on the imagination, we might think Spinoza has nothing good to say about this first kind of knowledge. This wouldn't be accurate for two reasons. First, he observes that our capacity for sense perception, that is, our imagination, exists because the body can be affected in many different ways, yet it still retains its own identity and physical integrity. Spinoza rightly regards this as a sign of the body's organic excellence and environmental adaptability. Second, and more important, Spinoza says that although the imagination is unreliable, it contains the seeds of more adequate and more dependable kinds of knowledge. He holds that the confusions and conflicts caused by the imagination can be overcome and resolved, but only in the second and third kinds of knowledge, which he calls reason and intuition. Let's look at reason, the second kind of knowledge. As we've seen, Spinoza believes that the chief cause of error in the imagination is confusion. Perceptual images are confused ideas that mix the signals our sense organs send with the nature of the things that send them. But Spinoza also believes there are certain other ideas that reflect characteristics common to all physical things. He claims that no confusion can come up with regard to these things. They're simple and everywhere the same. Those things which are common to all things can be conceived only adequately. This knowledge is like that which we'd all call natural scientific knowledge. It involves thinking in terms of the basic structural principles or laws of nature. Spinoza calls this kind of knowledge reason or knowledge of the second kind. It has to be distinguished from the first kind of knowledge, imagination, because imagination is the source of error and confusion. Reason reveals things as they truly are. Spinoza points out some of the characteristics of this second kind of knowledge. He said that all things happen necessarily in accordance with the laws of nature. So reason, which knows things as they truly are, reveals all things to be necessary. It is of the nature of reason to regard things as necessary, not as contingent. From this it follows that it depends only on the imagination that we regard things as contingent. Spinoza also claims that reason knows things in a certain timeless way. It is in the nature of reason to perceive things in the light of eternity. The proof of this is straightforward. It is in the nature of reason to regard things as necessary, not as contingent. Now it perceives this necessity truly, that is, as it is in itself. But this necessity is the very necessity of God's eternal nature. Therefore, it is in the nature of reason to regard things in the light of eternity. Spinoza suggests that there is yet a third kind of knowledge, intuition. The details of this highest kind of knowledge are not very clear, but it seems that it's related to reason in the following way. Through reason, we know that all things occur necessarily in accordance with the laws of nature. Events can be predicted and explained. But through intuition, we directly and immediately grasp the unity between individual things and the timeless structured power of God. Things are known as manifestations of God's infinite and eternal power, with no intermediate steps of inference. Spinoza says that both the second and the third kinds of knowledge, reason and intuition, reveal things in the light of eternity. Spinoza uses the Latin phrase sub specie eternitatis. This is perhaps the best known phrase of Spinoza's entire philosophy. More than any other, it sums up the whole tenor and direction of his thought. He would have us come to understand ourselves as a part of nature. He'd have us understand nature as the timelessly necessary expression of God's infinite, purposeless, and impersonal power. To understand in this way, each of us must overcome the limitations of being one physical body among many. 
we have to rise above the idiosyncrasies and distortions of our finite perceptual senses to perceive things in the light of eternity. We must know things not as they appear to us, but as they truly are in God. A sense of this exalted perspective on mankind and nature permeates all of Spinoza's writings. Here the poets and the scientists come together in their admiration and respect for him. This is the point at which reality is revealed in the light of eternity. Spinoza develops his philosophical system in a way that's abstract and sometimes difficult to follow. But the view that emerges is really quite modern and in many ways congenial to thoughtful and scientifically minded people in our century. In his view, humans are seen as a part and a product of nature, arising from and subject to natural forces and timeless laws. We are finite creatures at risk in a sometimes hostile environment. None of us will live forever. As Spinoza reminds us, The force by which a man perseveres in existing is limited and infinitely surpassed by the power of external causes. Human beings are not gods, nor are we formed in the image of God. We are part of God's active self-expression, but so are snowflakes, trees, and volcanoes. We have a special status, but not because we alone possess an immortal soul granted to us by a providentially benevolent creator. Rather, Spinoza says, we are special because our physical makeup is uniquely complex, and our physical complexities reflected in our mind's ability to perceive and ultimately to understand. He believes he's discovered the truth of the human condition and the secret of our unique ability to understand ourselves and the world. But Spinoza wants happiness, and it's not yet clear how understanding is related to emotions such as happiness and unhappiness, joy and sorrow. Nor is it clear how we're to achieve what Spinoza calls the mind's highest blessedness. To understand these, we must turn to his moral psychology and his doctrine of salvation. As Spinoza sees it, God cannot work miracles in the interests of mankind. He believes that God can't break the laws of his own nature so that a virgin can give birth to a divine son who will grow up to suffer for our sins. Nor has God written ethical rules on tablets of stone to guide mankind. According to Spinoza, all such stories come from the confusions of the imagination. Man's special status resides entirely in his exceptional ability to understand. If we're to experience salvation or live ethically, it must be by means of that understanding. But just what could the terms salvation and ethics mean to Spinoza? If there is no anthropomorphic divine judge who threatens eternal damnation for misconduct, what need is there for salvation? And if all human actions are the necessary effects of natural causes, what could be the point of an ethical code of conduct? These are questions a number of Spinoza's friends asked him in his own day. They were worried that his views might undermine religion by denying the existence of heaven and hell, might weaken law and morality by allowing criminals and sinners to claim that their deeds were the result of inevitable causal necessity. One friend wrote about his concerns in a letter. If we men are, in all our actions, under the power of God, like clay in the hands of the potter, how can any of us be accused of doing this or that, seeing that it was impossible for him to do otherwise? Everyone may plead, Thy power cannot be escaped from, O God. Therefore, since I could not act otherwise, I may justly be excused. This is an old, deeply important issue. Theology attempts to reconcile God's omnipotence with our moral responsibility. Scientifically-minded people try to reconcile the idea of moral responsibility with the deterministic view that every event, including every human action, is caused by prior events based on natural law. For Spinoza, of course, these are two versions of the same problem, because he identifies God with nature and God's will with the laws of nature. His answer to this question helps explain his whole approach to ethics. Spinoza agrees that in one sense the perpetrator of evil acts can be excused since the actions were inevitable in the course of nature, but he still believes a man may be rightly imprisoned or executed for breaking the law. Such legal sanctions are a natural consequence of society's efforts to protect itself from harm. 
But in addition to the punishment society visits on a wrongdoer, Spinoza argues that evil and vicious actions bring their own bad consequences for the person who performs them. He who acts greedily, hatefully, violently, or selfishly will be an unhappy man, for unhappiness follows naturally and inevitably from such actions. The venal man who acts in this way will have no chance for blessedness. Such people will be miserable not because God will punish them, but because misery is the natural consequence of vicious actions and attitudes. Indeed, Spinoza submits a view of human emotions to demonstrate that this is the case. You could say then, God punishes evildoers, but only in the sense that the laws of nature dictate that misery follows naturally upon doing and being evil. Spinoza is not interested in threatening people with divine punishment. He's interested in understanding human nature, human happiness. As he sees it, that's the point of studying ethics. Spinoza's understanding of ethics goes back to the ancients. The roots of his approach are to be found in Socrates, in Aristotle, in the Stoics, and in Lucretius. According to these ancient philosophers, the purpose of an ethical theory is to provide guidance in living a good life. The good life is simply the happy life, a life of joy and security, a life without pain, conflict, tension, or strife. These early authors were familiar, as all people are, with the pain of negative emotions like fear, hatred, envy, sadness, and anger. They saw people chasing impossible dreams and living lives of quiet, or not so quiet, desperation when their unrealistic dreams failed to materialize. These philosophers saw how the lack of self-control can lead to disaster and suffering. Fear, hatred, excessive ambition, impulsive actions, these they called unruly passions, and they sought to overcome them. The whole purpose of an ethical theory, as they saw it, is to explain the sources of happiness and of misery in human life, and to offer a plan for attaining the happiness and avoiding the misery. Spinoza agrees with this concept of the purpose of ethics, indeed of philosophy as a whole. As we've seen, he began his philosophical journey in the effort to find supreme and unending happiness. Noting that happiness and unhappiness seemed to be emotions, he tried to understand what emotions are, how they arise. He found that some emotions are pleasurable, others are painful. Most importantly, he found that we can control some while others seem to have us in their control. Like the ancients, Spinoza believed that achieving happiness requires us to overcome those painful emotions that control us. In doing this, we not only become happier, we achieve a kind of freedom and security unknown to those with uncontrolled negative emotions. Spinoza's strategy for attaining happiness and freedom depends on understanding emotions. In one of the most impressive of his achievements as a thinker, Spinoza presents a detailed and systematic theory of just what human emotions are, how they arise, how they can best be dealt with. As always, he proceeds in accordance with his geometrical method, basing his claims on what he's already proven regarding God, nature, and the human body and mind. In a striking passage, Spinoza distinguishes his approach from that of the preachers and other moralists. Most of those who have written about the emotions and human conduct seem to be dealing not with natural phenomena that follow the common laws of nature, but with phenomena outside nature. They appear to go so far as to conceive man in nature as a kingdom within a kingdom. They believe that he disturbs rather than follows nature's order. They assign the cause of human frailty not to the power of nature in general, but to some defect in human nature which they therefore bemoan, ridicule, despise, or, as is most frequently the case, abuse. They will doubtless find it surprising that I should attempt to treat of the faults and follies of mankind in the geometric manner, and that I should propose to bring logical reasoning to bear on what they claim is opposed to reason. But hatred, anger, envy, etc., follow from the same necessity and force of nature as do all other particular things. Thus, I shall consider human actions and appetites just as if it were an investigation into lines, planes, or solids. 
Spinoza's theory of the emotions begins with the human body as a composite organism. The body is a complex mode of extension whose chief concern is to maintain itself. The body seeks things that will prolong its life, and in the mind, this becomes an idea called desire. As the body interacts with other things in nature, its power to preserve itself intact is sometimes naturally increased. For example, the body may experience an increase in energy. The mind registers this increase in the body's energy as the emotional idea we call joy or pleasure. On the other hand, the body is sometimes naturally affected by other things that decrease its power for self-preservation. The mind's idea of the body's decrease in energy is called sadness or pain. Spinoza will use these three most basic emotions, desire, joy, and sadness, to develop a remarkably subtle and thorough account of human psychology. Since we can't understand how the mind can cause the body to do things, we must explain the body's behavior in purely physical terms. In taking this stand, Spinoza is anticipating modern attempts to explain behavior by studying the physical structure and function of the body and the brain. This was a very radical view in the 17th century, for common sense seems to tell us that the mind causes the body to act. Spinoza knows his viewpoint will encounter resistance. Men can hardly be induced to examine this view without prejudice. So strongly are they convinced that at the mere bidding of the mind the body can now be set in motion, now brought to rest, and can perform any number of actions which they think depend solely on the will of the mind. However, no one as yet has learned what the body can and cannot do without being determined by the mind solely from the laws of its nature, insofar as it is considered physical. Spinoza seeks to explain emotion based on the body's interaction with things around it. For example, when something causes us joy, that is, when something or someone causes an increase in our power to preserve ourselves, then we experience love towards that thing or that someone. From this, we can clearly understand what love and hate are. Love is nothing but joy, with the accompanying idea of an external cause. And hate is nothing but sadness, with the accompanying idea of an external cause. One who loves necessarily strives to have present and preserve the thing he loves. And on the other hand, he who hates strives to remove and destroy the thing he hates. The way these emotions arise explains why we love or hate things that have not directly affected us, but which may resemble things that have caused us pleasure or pain. From the mere fact that we imagine a thing to have some likeness to an object that usually affects the mind with joy or sadness, we love it or hate it. These stray loves and hatreds arising from chance similarities can lead to vacillation and conflicting emotions. If we imagine that a thing which usually affects us with an emotion of sadness is like another which usually affects us with an equally great emotion of joy, we shall hate it and at the same time love it. Since we want to preserve the things and people we love because they cause us joy, we will develop loves and hatreds towards other things which hurt or help these objects of love. Every individual is motivated by the desire to survive, so an ethical program will be accepted only if it appeals directly to each person's self-interest. Spinoza is a clear-headed egoist in this regard. The only motives anyone has are self-interested motives. It makes no sense to recommend an ethical doctrine on any other grounds. If people are to be virtuous, it can only be because virtue is in each individual's self-interest. Traditionally, moralists have thought that there is some God-given standard of what is good and what is bad, and that we have a duty to live up to that standard by always choosing what is good. Spinoza, not surprisingly, thinks that this view is confused. He believes the traditional moralists have put the cart before the horse. According to him, we do not choose things because we judge them to be good. Rather, we judge things to be good because we want them. It is clear that we neither strive for nor will, neither want nor desire anything because we judge it to be good. On the contrary, we judge something to be good because we strive for it, will it, 
want it or desire it. And so each one from his own emotions judges a thing good or bad. In fact, Spinoza holds that the words good and evil do not refer to any objective characteristic of things in themselves at all. As far as good and evil are concerned, they indicate nothing positive in things considered in themselves, nor are they anything other than modes of thinking or notions that we form because we compare things to one another. For one and the same thing can, at the same time, be good and bad, and also indifferent. For example, music is good for one who is melancholy, bad for one who is mourning, and neither good nor bad to one who is deaf. The traditional moralists had tried to establish a definition of goodness that's independent of people's actual makeup and desires. Spinoza says this was bound to fail. We can be certain of at least one thing. Everyone wants to increase his power to survive. The only appropriate way to use the term good, then, is to refer to those things that will truly make us stronger and help us survive. This is the true good that Spinoza seeks to explain. He thinks it's obvious that people have an interest in controlling their own emotions rather than having their emotions control them. All the confused and conflicting emotions we've discussed so far arise from chance encounters with things in the external world. Spinoza says humans have little control over emotions stimulated from without. These are passive emotions. There are some emotions, though, that can arise from within us. They may arise from our own powers, and they, therefore, may be regarded as active emotions. To the extent that these active emotions can predominate in someone's psychological life, he is more in control, and less hostage to the raging seas of passion and the changing winds of fortune. When we discussed Spinoza's doctrine of knowledge, we noted that the higher kinds of knowledge, reason and intuition, proceed from ideas of the laws of nature. These laws are ideas that are adequate in the mind. We reason about things in an order provided by the ideas in our minds rather than imaginatively perceiving things in whatever order they happen to come in contact with our bodies. In this sense, we're more active when reasoning than when imagining, because the order of ideas arises from within our minds. The very increase in activity produced by rational thought is experienced as joy, since it reflects an increase in our own active power. Moreover, since our thoughts are determined from within, when we're reasoning, we're more self-determining, more free. Thus, the active emotion of joy engendered by reason and understanding provides a means to counteract the inconstant and erratic impulses of the passions. Spinoza's strategy in presenting his ethical theory is to sketch a life that maximizes the active emotions, emotions that arise from understanding. By examining that life, we can determine how a genuinely stable, free person would act. Then we can use these insights as guidelines for developing strength and freedom for ourselves. Rather than laying down a series of rules and prohibitions for correct behavior, Spinoza describes the life of someone who concentrates on gaining the strength, stability, and freedom that reason and understanding can provide. Rather than talking about goodness in the abstract, Spinoza asks what would be good for such a person? What would help him or her to gain the desired understanding? Certain ways of acting that are traditionally thought to be good turn out to be good from Spinoza's perspective as well. More importantly, for someone attempting to live the life of reason and understanding, there's nothing more valuable than the companionship of like-minded people. Thus, those actions that promote peace and social harmony turn out to be truly good. Though Spinoza believes that most people are unreasonable and difficult to deal with, still he judges the company of other people to be a good thing. It rarely happens that men live according to the guidance of reason. Instead, their lives are so constituted that they are usually envious and burdensome to one another. Still, we surely do derive from the society of our fellow men many more advantages than disadvantages. So let the satirists laugh as much as they like at human affairs. 
Let the theologians curse them. Let the melancholics praise as much as they can a life that is uncultivated and wild. Men still find from experience that by helping one another they can provide themselves much more easily with the things they require, and only by joining forces can they avoid the dangers that threaten on all sides. Conflict most often arises among people when they all seek things that only one or a few can have. Here one man's gain is another's loss, a situation that today we call a zero-sum game. But for those who seek understanding, there's no need for envious competition. The greatest good of those who seek virtue is common to all and can be enjoyed by all equally. Indeed, each of us has an interest in encouraging and helping others to pursue knowledge and live reasonably. While discussing social harmony, Spinoza pauses to explain the origins of the state. He says that if everyone were reasonable, there would be no serious conflicts among people. But since most are prey to their unruly passions and hence are often at odds with one another, states and laws have been set up to ensure cooperation and keep people from harming each other. Since emotions can only be checked by other, stronger emotions, the state uses people's fear of punishment to counterbalance their greed, envy, and anger. Spinoza says, In this way, society has the power to prescribe a common rule of life, to make laws and to maintain them, not by reason, but by threats. This society maintained by its laws and the power it has of preserving itself, is called a state. And those who are defended by its laws are called citizens. The state assures some measure of peaceful coexistence, even among those who are not guided by reason. Things being as they are, Spinoza says the state's a good thing but he believes that legal enforcement of social cooperation would not be required if everyone recognized the true good and lived according to reason. In recounting how a truly virtuous person lives, Spinoza points out what he sees as important errors in other traditional ethical views. The Calvinists had condemned pleasure, for example. Spinoza says this is needless and harmful asceticism. Pleasure or joy is a good thing, a sign of the body's vitality. Of course, some kinds of pleasure which benefit only a part of the body at the cost of the well-being of the whole are indeed evil. One thinks of the excesses of gluttony, drunkenness, or lust. But Spinoza holds that the Protestant's rejection of dance, of the theater, of art, and other such things is morbid and harmful. It is the part of the wise man, I say, to refresh and restore himself in moderation with pleasant food and drink, with fragrances, with the beauty of green plants, with decoration, music, sports, the theater, and other things of this kind, which anyone can use without injury to another. For the human body is composed of a great many parts of different natures, which constantly require new and varied nourishment, so that the whole body may be equally capable of all the things which can follow from its nature, and hence so that the mind may also be equally capable of understanding many things. In Spinoza's view, emotions that involve sadness or pain are obviously necessarily bad. They indicate a lessening of the body's power. Not surprisingly, Spinoza also says that fear, despair, remorse, shame, and all forms of hatred are bad. Spinoza describes the life of the wise and free man. His picture's vivid, in many ways deeply attractive, but he's not yet told us how we can attain this kind of stability, how we can move from being driven by our confused and misleading emotions to being guided by reason. Spinoza can't just exhort us to control our emotions and actions by means of willpower. In his view, there's no such thing as the will in this sense. The mind cannot simply make the body act. The final part of Spinoza's book Ethics is called On the Power of the Intellect, or Human Freedom. It deals with the difficult question of how reason can influence the emotions, bring them into rational order, and thus make possible the strong and stable kind of life that Spinoza's been describing. The only power the intellect has is the power to understand. Thus, whatever 
good effect reason can have in the emotions, it must achieve by means of understanding. Spinoza's philosophical therapy, as it might be called, is based on a single profound insight. To understand our emotions is to be related to them. That's very different from simply having them. Rational understanding, based on adequate ideas, reveals the causes of our emotional states. And reason reveals all these things to be necessary consequences of the order and laws of nature. Our painful emotions are lessened if we realize that all things are necessary and inevitable. We see that pain arising from the loss of any good is mitigated as soon as the person who lost it perceives that it could not by any means have been preserved. The important point about understanding the necessity of all things is especially germane in our dealings with other people. Spinoza notes that we seem to get especially angry, hurt, or disappointed at what other people sometimes do. We tend to have passionate emotions towards other people because we ignorantly think their actions had no external causes, and that they acted only from their own free will. But once we realize that there is no free will, and that each individual is part of the causal order of nature, we'll no longer be so emotionally volatile towards others. We get upset at others because we want them to act differently. But Spinoza follows the Stoic philosophers who had urged us not to want things to be different from the way they necessarily are. In a sweeping statement, Spinoza sums up this view. Insofar as we are intelligent beings, we cannot desire anything save that which is necessary. A rational, adequate understanding of things, and especially of our own emotions, can ease the destructive power of the passions. Reason reveals things as they truly are, and thus overcomes many of imagination's false ideas underlying the powerful, passive emotions. But Spinoza also maintains that reason and understanding can influence the emotions in an even more direct way. When we think rationally, the order of ideas arises from within our own minds rather than by chance in our encounters with things in nature. Thus, we're more active when we think rationally, and this is experienced as an increase in our own power, an experience that's by definition pleasurable or joyful. This positive emotion of pleasure can itself directly balance or counter other painful emotions, and the more we understand, the greater the pleasure we experience. As Spinoza says, one, therefore, who is anxious to moderate his emotions and appetites for the love of freedom alone, will strive as far as he can to come to know the virtues and their causes, and to fill his mind with the gladness which arises from the true knowledge of them. Spinoza describes one more way to overcome the errant passions through understanding. In his view, to truly understand anything is to know how it's rooted in the unchanging laws of nature. To know things in this way, especially through intuition, is to know things as manifestations of the eternal and infinite power of God. Thus, every truly adequate understanding of anything involves reference to God. Spinoza reaches the following remarkable conclusion. He who clearly and distinctly understands himself and his emotions loves God, and the more so, the more he understands himself and his emotions. This claim follows inexorably from what has gone before. Adequate knowledge understands God to be the cause of all things. Understanding is itself pleasurable or joyful, and love is by definition pleasure or joy, accompanied by the idea of what causes the pleasure. Spinoza says this love of God, engendered by our understanding of things, is an unusually pure and intense love. Since every act of real understanding involves God and is necessarily pleasurable, it's impossible that any hatred could infect our love of God. Nor will this love be tainted by envy or jealousy of others, for such jealousy can arise only when people are contending for the affection of the beloved. Such rivalry makes no sense for those who love God because God is incapable of human emotions. Spinoza says, He who loves God cannot endeavor that God should love him in return. It's important to emphasize this point. 
Spinoza says that only an error of the imagination could lead one to think that God is capable of loving us. Yet Spinoza doesn't hesitate to urge that we should love God purely, fully, and above all things. He says those who would want God to love them in return misunderstand his nature. Those who feel that they should in some way be rewarded for their love of God misunderstand the nature of this most meaningful and fulfilling of human experiences. At this point, Spinoza makes a surprising pronouncement. With this, I have completed everything which concerns this present life. So it is time now to pass to those things which pertain to the mind's duration without relation to the body. This is unexpected. It appears to be inconsistent with what's gone before. Spinoza holds that the mind and the body are one and the same thing, though understood in two different ways. How then can he speak of the mind as if it could exist without relation to the body? We can understand this only if we remember to distinguish between the ideas of the imagination and the ideas of reason and intuition. Imagination consists of ideas about how the body is affected by other things, but reason and intuition begin with adequate ideas of the laws of nature. These laws are eternal, unchanging, and not limited to our temporary physical existence. Thus, to the extent that our minds are focused on natural laws and on the way all things follow from God or nature, our minds can participate in the timelessness, the eternity of God. This is Spinoza's doctrine of eternal life, but it must be clearly distinguished from more traditional views that promise everlasting life in some blissful heavenly abode. Spinoza contrasts his doctrine with the more common view. If we attend to the common opinion of men, we shall see that they are indeed conscious of the eternity of the mind, but that they confuse it with duration and attribute it to the imagination or memory which they believe remains after death. For Spinoza, eternal life is not something that awaits us after death, but something we can experience and take part in right here and now by coming to understand ourselves as we are in God. Ideas of time, of duration, and of memory are all ideas of the imagination. Insofar as we rise from the confused level of imagination up through reason to the heights of intuitive knowledge, our minds transcend time and participate in eternity. To participate in the pure activity of God's self-expression is a joyful experience, and we know God to be its cause. Spinoza calls it the intellectual love of God, for it's a pure love born of intuitive knowledge of the identity between our own minds and the mind of God. He says, from the highest kind of knowledge, there necessarily arises an intellectual love of God. For from this kind of knowledge, there arises joy, accompanied by the idea of God as its cause. That is, love of God, not in so far as we imagine Him as present, but in so far as we understand God to be eternal. The intellectual love of God is the mind's conscious participation in the eternity of God's creative activity. Spinoza tells us that this is the most powerful and most satisfying of human emotions. This is the emotional state he calls blessedness. From this, we clearly understand wherein our salvation or blessedness or freedom consists, that is, in a constant and eternal love of God. We're not told very much about this state of mind, but many scholars have thought that Spinoza is talking about an experience much like that which the mystics of the East and West have long spoken of, the mystical experience of union with God. What makes Spinoza's position unusual and original, though, is his view that rational scientific knowledge, the perception of our place in the causal order of nature, can yield such an experience. If I know that all my desires, my dreams, and my passions flow naturally from the law-like structure of God's eternal creativity, then I can feel myself to be a manifestation of God's activity. I'm a participant in that timeless process. If I deeply know that everything that occurs is absolutely necessary and that all things are interconnected, I'm not likely to become emotionally distraught when things don't go the way I want them to. 
Freed from the upheavals of the passions, seeing all things in the light of eternity, mindful that all things are manifestations of God, this is the life of blessedness, that supreme and unending happiness Spinoza set out to find. He sums up the differences between this life led by the wise and the life of the ignorant. The ignorant man, besides being driven hither and thither by external causes, never possessing true contentment of spirit, lives as if he were unconscious of himself, God, and things, and as soon as he ceases to be passive, he at once ceases to be at all. On the other hand, the wise man suffers scarcely any disturbance of spirit, but being conscious, by virtue of a certain eternal necessity, of himself, of God, and of things, never ceases to be, but always possesses true spiritual contentment. We know that Spinoza did indeed possess the true spiritual contentment mentioned here. He was rejected by his own people, he lived in poverty, he was ill, and faced the prospect of an early death. He was publicly attacked as an infamous, evil, and dangerous man. With all this, however, his writings, especially his letters, give evidence of a peaceful, calm, and even serene temperament. In recognizing the necessity of all things, he freed himself from frustration and desire. In understanding his emotions, he found a way to calm them. In understanding his own status as a part of nature, he achieved a thoughtful union with God, and thus found the peace and happiness he had sought. Spinoza had no illusions about the difficulty of achieving such a state of mind. He knew that very few people have ever done this, and perhaps very few ever will. This supreme level of contentment and joy requires that we give up our normal, limited way of viewing things. We must cease to focus so much on the way things affect us and view them instead in a less self-centered way. Understanding things rationally rather than by means of the imagination is precisely such a shift from a self-centered view of the world to a more impersonal perspective. Paradoxically, we can find real happiness only by adopting a view of things which pays no attention to our own happiness or unhappiness. Achieving this kind of detached, dispassionate, and yet loving comprehension of the world is not easy, but Spinoza insists that it's possible. If the road I have pointed out as leading to this goal seems very difficult, yet it can be found. Indeed, what is so rarely discovered is bound to be hard. For if salvation were ready to hand and could be easily discovered without great toil, how could it be? that it is almost universally neglected. All things excellent are as difficult as they are rare. These are the words with which Spinoza closes the ethics. And they're fitting words for closing our presentation as well. Spinoza's thought is indeed difficult, but his system is one of rare excellence. His ideas have challenged and inspired philosophers, poets, and scientists for three centuries since his death. In all ages, there will be thoughtful people who desire spiritual contentment, but who are unable to accept the doctrines of traditional religious faiths. It's likely that in all ages there will be sensitive people who experience awe and reverence at the timeless power of the natural order and at the power of our minds to understand that order. And so it's likely that in all ages there will be people who study and admire Baruch, which means the blessed Spinoza.